This lesson is called Unlocking the Door to a Difficult Text. This is a demonstration lesson transferred to an online format. I will be switching character throughout, playing either a candidate for a teaching position or a teacher. When you see this graphic, you will know that this is a teacher slide rather than a candidate slide. I would share these standards with the class because I think it is important for them to know what they are expected to master according to the PA standards and the Common Core so that they know the mastery goals that have been established for them. I am a sociocultural teacher, meaning that I believe we all learn in social situations and that even independent learning is supported by our social interactions. Through language, both verbal and physical, we learn the ways of the world. People learn more when they are in an environment that fosters cooperation, collaboration, and effective communication. In my classroom, I will have high expectations for all of my students, even those I have just met. I will demonstrate those high expectations in many ways, but two of the ways I highlight here using higher level vocabulary and doing activities that require higher level thinking. I want to develop a learning environment that invites students to ask questions and helps students to take ownership of their learning. In this way, we develop a relationship of cognitive apprenticeship. As you proceed through the upper grades, the literature you read will become more complex and difficult to understand. You'll meet authors such as Shakespeare, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Hughes, Orwell, Poe, Angelou, Wright, Dickens, and others who will perplex you with how they weave their tales, poetry, and prose. Today I want to explore with you why these authors might present conundrums or puzzles that are difficult to unravel. Our main objective today is to learn how to unlock the door to difficult texts. I would like this to be a group decision, so let's get into groups of four and take a minute or two to discuss the question on the, on the board right now. What is the most difficult book you have read lately and why was it the most difficult? I'm going to give one person a sheet of paper to be the recorder. For the sake of time, I'm going to designate one person to be the group leader and keep the conversation on track. Do you have any questions? Are you ready? Okay, let's go. I was trying to come up with some responses that I think I, I might hear from students um, after they've had a chance to get together in their groups and discuss uh, the most difficult books they've read lately and why. I would think that some of them might mention Harry Potter, anything uh, in the Harry Potter series, or the Hunger Games trilogy, or if my fifth graders were in the room, they would say Amos Fortune Freeman because that was a very difficult book for them to read. And after I've collected their responses, I would tell them that these are great examples. And then I would say, why? Why were these so difficult to read? Some of the answers that uh, I might hear would be that um, in the books, the, the authors refer to things that they don't know about. Uh, it could be an historical event, or it could be uh, a place or a time period or something cultural that they just didn't understand and had never seen before. The vocabulary could be difficult. Um, the setting or other another literary element could be unfamiliar, so it would be difficult for them to create pictures in their minds, um, uh, for example, of the setting because they have never seen anything like it before. Or the genre could be new to the students. You know, perhaps they're reading a sci-fi book for the first time, and uh, they don't know that genre and there are certain differences between a sci-fi book and uh, and uh, historical fiction so that those are the things that could trip up uh, students usually that was a great discussion and I want to uh, say that one of the reasons that these authors works uh, might be difficult to read is because they all use allusions in their work Allusions are like literary shorthand, and they use them to quickly convey meaning. They want you to create a picture in your head very quickly uh, so that you will understand what they're trying to say um, without them having to go into too much detail about it. 
Let's take a look at a comprehensive definition of illusion. An illusion is a reference to a statement, a person, a place, or an event from literature, the arts, history, religion, mythology, politics, sports, or science. On the pro side, an illusion usually refers to something that is common knowledge. On the con side, if it doesn't, then readers can end up confused or they can miss the reference altogether. As I was surveying uh, the different texts, uh, literature texts for examples of illusions, I saw this poem by Robert Frost quite a few times. The poem is called Out Out. Now, with just a two-word allusion to a part of Macbeth by William Shakespeare, Frost has given the reader an introduction to the poem's content and conclusion. The lines that Frost's, Frost alludes to are shown on this slide. The poem Out Out is about a young boy who dies after his hand is severed by a saw in an accident. And I take it that the boy is the brief candle that shows in the first uh, line of those lines that were cited from Macbeth. If you've never read the play, and then you would not have noticed the illusion, um, and would probably find the title pretty confusing. This poem is an example of the risks that authors take when using illusion. The other day I heard when I was listening to a book uh, a character say, I spocked an eyebrow. Well, what if you aren't a Star Trek fan like I am? You would have been totally confused by the illusion I, I, came, I came across recently in this book by Jim Butcher called Small Favor, which is a part of a series of books called The Dresden Files. Spock is a character in the sci-fi series Star Trek, from which there have been numerous spin-offs and movies. Spock is a very logical character, and when he senses something illogical has been said or done, he cocks his eyebrow in disbelief, like you see in the pictures of Leonard Nimoy as Spock and Jim Butcher on this slide. If I had not caught the illusion, I would not have understood what Dresden meant, but since I did, I could see his expression clearly and understood that he was not believing what he was hearing from the other character in the scene. At this point in the lesson, I would ask the students, what can you do if you don't understand an illusion? And I would ask them to throw some ideas on the board. I expect to hear that you can Google it, <laughs> you can ask someone like the teacher, you can look in the textbook, or you could read about the book. And I could add a few sites uh, that the students could use to read summaries and analyses of um, the books that they're reading or the poems um, or the essays. You know, schmoop.com, enotes.com, uh, sparknotes.com all have great uh, summaries and analyses, and they're written by people who hold master's uh, degrees or PhDs. Go to take a look at uh, a poem by Langston Hughes called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. We're going to listen to an mp3 now of Langston Hughes explaining how the poem came to be and then an mp3 of the poem itself. And afterward I will do a think aloud for you and explain how the allusions in the poem helped me appreciate the poem more and how researching the poem helped also. When I play this slide uh, I would also be playing the mp3 of um, Langston Hughes speaking uh, and, and explaining to us uh, where he was, you know, where his inspiration for the poem came from and where he was when he started to write the poem. And then we would have the mp3 of the poem itself. At this point, uh, I would probably start circling things uh, that I found in the poem, such as Euphrates, Congo, Nile, pyramids, etc., um, Mississippi, Abe Lincoln, New Orleans. And I would do a think aloud, where I would say, I'm thinking to myself that I know uh, about the Euphrates and its, its significance because I was a history major in college. And I remember that this was considered part of the birthplace of civilization, along with the Tigris River. So, 
the speaker in this poem is ancient and has seen the rise and growth of civilization. I also understand almost intuitively the reference to the Nile and the pyramids since I studied that history and visited Egypt in 2003. I've seen the pyramids and they are awesome. So let's look at the others. And at this point, I'm trying to get them to see that prior knowledge and background knowledge is very important, uh, a very important part of understanding illusions. In line six, uh, we come across another allusion to the Congo River Basin in central western Africa. And from the intro, um, we know that when Hughes makes the allusion to Abraham Lincoln, he is referring to the time in which he saw the auction of slaves in New Orleans an important historical event. The auctions horrified Lincoln and he never forgot them. The reference to Lincoln is also an illusion because he was responsible for the end of slavery. The allusion to the Mississippi reminds readers that to go down to uh, go down the Mississippi was the worst event in a slave's life and many slaves made that trip. I researched the poem to help me understand it more. A great site that I have found is schmoop.com. The articles are written by PhDs for the most part in language that anybody can understand. It also helped to hear the introduction by Langston Hughes and I hope it helped you too because then I understood the reference to Mississippi, Abe Lincoln and New Orleans and how he was inspired to write the poem. Now we're going to listen to Ego Tripping by Nikki Giovanni and I hope it makes you laugh a little but I also hope it makes you think. I would like you to listen and talk to the text by making notes on your handout and underlining the illusions you find. Then we'll talk about it. When this slide appears, um, Nikki Giovanni starts to recite her poem. At this point, we would do some more group work, uh, and I would put the students back into the groups that they were in before. Um, and I would give each group perhaps one or two uh, stanzas of this poem and ask them to find as many of the illusions as they can. Uh, there are so many in this poem. And I would ask them to, to explain uh, how the illusions that they found uh, contributed to their understanding of the poem and what kind of pictures um, played in their mind when they were listening to and then reading the poem. Afterward, after uh, a bit of group work, we could come back together and discuss this as a group. I hope you'll indulge me with a, a couple of seconds uh, to go over some metaphors I've created. We have a cultural body and creative works such as poetry, prose, art, dance, drama, and music, for example, are the bones of a body of culture. Then we have figurative language. Illusions, metaphors, similes, and other types of figurative language are the connective tissue of a body of culture. They make the body stronger, keep it in form, and help it to move fluidly. Figurative language can show up in any creative work. For example, an artist can create a painting based on a metaphor or an allusion to a famous event. Finally, we have the heart of the cultural body. Communication is the heart of our cultural body. Communication leads to community and can take many forms, written, spoken, musical, artistic, and so forth. It often starts with a thought. Many educators, including me, believe that thought cannot be divorced from language. And that, my friends, is why you study our shared language, English. When you use our shared language, and use it well, you become an integral player in the culture we share. I'd return again then to the standards and I'd ask the students, did we meet our objectives in this lesson? Did we cover the Pennsylvania standards? Um, did we cover the Common Core standards? Do you think that we did a good job? Let's check. Then I, I would ask them if we met the, the other objective to foster collaboration, cooperation, and communication. Did we do enough of that during this lesson? Should we have done more? I think it's important for students to have a say uh, in their learning and in the activities they do in school. I think it's